comes to female musicians, right? You know, they say Aretha Franklin is the queen of soul. Madonna is the queen of pop. Mary J. Blige is the queen of hip-hop and R&B. Janis Joplin is the queen of rock. Ella Fitzgerald is the queen of jazz music. Dolly Parton is the queen of country music. And we can say Nicki Minaj is the queen of hip-hop because she broke so many records. But uh, when it comes to the queen of disco, the nominees are, that's what they said. They got Gloria Gaynor, Sylvester, Grace Jones, and Shaka Khan. But I give it to Donna Summer. She's the one who made disco music what it is. She's the real queen of disco music. And she's also known as the mother of modern dance music. And they also call her the first lady of love with a music career that spans over five decades. Wow. Let's look at her stats, right? Donna Summer has put out 17 albums. She's a five-time Grammy Award winner. She won Grammys in the categories of R&B, rock, gospel, and dance music. Six American Music Awards. She was the first and only artist to have three consecutive platinum double albums reach the top of the U.S. Billboard 200 charts. Plus, she was the only one to have four number one singles in a year. 19 number one hits has sold over 140 million records worldwide, making her one of the best selling artists of all time. Billboard magazine named her the 14th greatest female soloist of all time. She was the first black woman to be nominated for an MTV Video Music Award. Plus, she was the first black female artist to have her song played on MTV. Sex symbol, changed the game with a fashion. She was a brilliant, critically acclaimed painter and she can sing and speak German fluently. It's safe to say Donna Summer and disco music help open the doors for hip hop music. Whether you like it or not, it was the disco music and the gay clubs that opened the door and helped usher rap music in the beginning stages. All the accomplishments and history she made throughout her career, I don't think I know another artist who has did what she has done. I gotta get right into her story. Let's get right into the story right now. Donna Summer, whose real name, right, is LaDonna Adrian Gaines, and she was born on December 31st, 1948, in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, she was the third born out of seven kids from her parents. There were six girls and one boy. And they lived in the housing projects in Boston. A little side note, right? Now, Donna says she's also related to Bobby Brown down the line. Wow. Now, see, Donna and her family, they ended up moving to a safer area in Boston after Donna was shot in her face by some sort of cap gun, she said, or small caliber type of gun, probably like a BB gun or something. She got shot in her face when she was real small walking home with her friends from school wow yeah they said she was walking home with her friends as a little girl and somebody started shooting and she got hit right in her face and her brother saved her now after that incident they moved to a three-story house in a multiracial uh neighborhood just 10 blocks from the home where john f kennedy and his family the kennedys used to live basically look donna's whole family they stayed with each other, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandmother was there, everything. And they was all dedicated church people. They always was in church. And, you know, it, it was rough trying to survive growing up. Her father worked three jobs to keep a roof over their head. And if they ran out of food, he would just go fishing and put food on the table. 
But you know, ever since she was a toddler, she was always singing all the time. She was a big fan of Mahalia Jackson, Dinah Washington, Dionne Ward, the Supremes, all the girl groups Motown had back in the day. And by the age of 10 years old, she finally got her chance to sing a solo in church after one of the church singers was sick and didn't show up that day. And when she got up there and sang that day, she had everybody crying in church. Everybody was in shock because of her voice. But what they didn't know was that, see, Donna had been practicing. She had been practicing. And when she did that solo for the first time in church that day, she sounded just like, like a grown woman. She sounded like a grown woman, the voice she had that we all love. She had that voice at 10 years old. And everybody was just in tears and couldn't believe it. And from there, she just started singing like four or five times a day, every Sunday, around different churches. Now, also around that time, you know, Donna ended up with a big gash on her cheek that would just stay with her for the rest of her life. She ended up hitting her face on a sharp object that was on a chair. And that made her real insecure by her looks growing up because... You know, kids and grown people would tease her and call her names. And that used to make her think that she was ugly and unattractive. And she couldn't wear no makeup and stuff like that because her father was very strict. They couldn't put no polish on their nails or anything. He wasn't having it. But by the time she hit high school, she was starring in a lot of musical plays, which made her a popular girl in school. Also in high school, at the age of 17 years old, she ended up joining a blues rock band named Crow. And she was the only female and black person in that band. And they wanted her to sing like Janis Joplin. And look, she actually saw, she saw Janis Joplin perform in a club at that time, which blew her mind and motivated her to keep pursuing her music career. And her and her band became very popular in Boston, which led to them going to New York to do some shows. Now, another reason she was happy to leave Boston and go to New York at that time was because she had witnessed a murder. Yeah, she witnessed a murder for some guys in a gang that she knew because one of them guys actually went to a church. Now, that incident, the guys, they punched, they punched the old lady and took her purse. And when the women ended up dying, when I hit the ground, Donna was right there when the whole incident happened. So she had to testify against these guys in that gang. And when she did that, she started receiving death threats. So her family happily agreed for her to leave Boston for her safety. And she had to drop out of school, too. And she was just a few weeks from graduating. Because, look, that gang, that gang was very dangerous that she testified against. Now in New York with her band, The Crows, right, they was offered a record deal with RCA Records, but the label really only wanted to sign Donna, the singer. And the group, you know, they ended up breaking up anyway. And that's when she decided just to audition for the Broadway musical play called Hair. After one of her friends introduced her to the director of the play after he heard her singing voice. And she got the part. She landed the role of Sheila and decided to travel with the show on a road all the way to Germany in which her parents, they wasn't, they wasn't really happy about that first. They let her go to New York for her safety, but Germany was different. That's what she wanted to do. So they let her pursue her dreams. Plus her father, she picked Germany anyway because her father, he was in a war in Germany. He was over there in Germany. Plus Donna, you know, she said she wanted to leave America at that time anyway because too much racism, crime was so bad at that time. She said also one time in New York, she got beat up real bad right on the street by a black Muslim just for walking with two Jewish girls. Wow. Plus she got a, she escaped a kidnapping too one time. Two guys tried to kidnap her. You know, she done been through a lot of stuff, man. But anyway... Now in Germany doing musicals right, she ended up becoming close with a guy named Helmut Sommer, who was a white Austrian actor on the road with that same theater company she was part of. 
and they fell in love and got married and they ended up having a child together her first daughter Mimi now after that they ended up living with her husband Helma's parents but the relationship didn't work out so they ended up getting divorced but Donna stayed in Germany to pursue her acting and music career and she continued to do plays she was in the plays called Showboat Porgy and Bess Godspell and the Me Nobody Knows plus around that time you know when she was doing those plays she got to meet legendary entertainer Josephine Baker before she passed wow it's another story I need to do now another person who was part of those plays y'all might know was Robert Gilliam y'all probably know him from the TV show Benson but him and Donna became good friends too around that time now around 1974 she started working as a part-time model and backup singer for music producers Pete Bellotti and Giorgio Morata at their label called Oasis Records. They was looking for a songwriter for their new sound, which was a combination of, you know, they was making sounds like R&B, soul, pop, funk, rock, electronica type stuff. They were using um, electronic synthesizers, making them beats, right? And once she got with them, they had did a song called Hostage that she had laid the vocals down for somebody else to sing, really. But it sounded so good when she did it, they decided to put it out as a single just for Donna. And when they put it out, they misspelled her last name because her last name was S-O-M-M-E-R, Summer. But they spelled it S-U-M-M-E-R. But she just, she just stuck with it, even though they had been divorced, but... She just stuck with the last name Summer. And look, that song, Hostage, ended up going number one in France. But here's the crazy part, though. In Germany, where she was living, the song was taken off the radio because at the time, a Berlin politician was kidnapped and held for ransom and people was all upset about the title of the song. But that was motivation for her, though. It was a motivation for her that she could become a big star in the music industry. And she ended up releasing an album called Lady of the Night, which did sell over there in the UK. But she then did a song. She did a song that would change her life forever, which was called Love to Love You Baby. Now, see, when it comes to that song, right, Donna said she was just joking around in the studio because... They wanted her to sound sexy and do all that moaning and groaning. So the only way for her to be sexy on that song was to try to sing it like if Marilyn Monroe was singing it. Because Donna really thought they was going to give that song to one of the other female singers they had on the label. And she was just doing the demos for these other artists. She wanted somebody else to sing it. But when she did the song, they liked her version so much that they ended up releasing it and you know what it was a smash hit but it was a smash hit more so over in the netherlands and the first title was just called love to love you but see her producer giorgio Morata, was trying to get it played in the u.s and he ended up sending the song to neil bogart who owned casablanca records back in america who at the time, the only artist he had at the time was uh, the heavy metal rock band called Kiss to his label. And, you know, disco music was becoming popular at that time in the clubs. And Neil Bogart loved the song so much that he ended up buying the rights to the song. Because, see, <laughs> what had happened was Neil Bogart and his wife had played the Love to Love You Baby song at a party they was having. And the people just couldn't get enough of it. They just kept playing the song over and over and over again the people just kept requesting it and that's when neil bogart requested donna's producer giorgio to make the song longer he asked could you make that song longer because he had an idea and how to market that song and that's when he made the new version of the song 17 minutes long and in the extended version they say they counted 22 orgasms from all that moaning and groaning she was doing wow that's crazy and look when they released the new long version of the song the song just took off all the way to number one on the charts 
the song went straight to the history books. Look, 1995, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame named it one of the 500 songs that shaped rock and roll. And you know, Donna, Donna didn't even know they released the song in America. She just got a call from her producer, Giorgio, one day, who told her to pack her bags. She was headed to America to promote the song. Wow. And after eight years of being in Germany, she was going back to America. Now, when she got to America, Casablanca Records signed her, put her right to work, and they released the album titled Love to Love You Baby, which sold over a million copies, making her an instant star. After that, she started traveling the world, promoting her album, and then the rumors started coming out that she was a transvestite because she was so popular in the gay clubs and people would just stare at her to see if she was really a man. <laughs> she said, uh, Donna said she would do interviews and people would just stare at her and then they'll say, you don't look like a man. Wow. Something about she got big hands and she was tall and all this. That's why they thought she was a man. And look, at first, right, she just thought it was funny. But later on, she started getting mad about those transgender rumors because it started to upset her parents. And you know, her biggest fan base were the gay and trans community, too. But that Love to Love You Baby song was so big in the disco clubs. And every time she would perform it in the venues and concerts live, that she got... She ended up getting scared and she feared for her life because everybody looked at her like a sex symbol. Men, women in the audience would be throwing their drawers and bras on the stage and everything. They loved this song. Donna said one time she performed a song in Italy in front of 5,000 people, which was mainly men in the crowd, right? She said the men got so crazy when she started doing that orgasm and moaning part. That she had to be rushed off stage right to her trailer because the men tore the stage up and was rocking her trailer just to get to her. Wow. That had to be scared. And you know what? That really scared her. It scared her. It scared her being a sex symbol because she was very religious. And she came from a church background. And look, it got to the point that she stopped performing the song because riots would break out. She had stalkers. She said she had a famous actor who used to stalk her, but she didn't reveal his name, but she really, she really couldn't go nowhere. She had to have bodyguards 24 seven with her and everything. Fans would come up to her and tell her that they had their first orgasm while having sex to the Love to Love You Baby song. She said she stopped singing the song because it became too dangerous. Plus, here's the other side of it though, right? Some people, didn't like the song they say uh the love to love you baby song was banned by the bbc in britain and and when it came to america reverend jesse jackson he used this group called operation push which stood for people united to save humanity to rally against that song and he was going against some other songs at the time too reverend jesse jackson claimed those type of songs increased teen pregnancy wow now, after that, right, about eight months later, she released the album titled A Love Trilogy that had the singles Try Me, I Know We Can Make It, and a cover of Barry Manilow's song called Could It Be Magic. And that album ended up going certified gold. Then she released another album called Four Seasons, A Love, right after that. But see, all the fame and the attention she was getting was just starting to get to her at that time. Plus, she was missing her daughter, and she was always alone on the road as a new artist. Her ex-husband was trying to get custody of their daughter. Then she had the pressure from the record label for her to be a sex symbol, and she just couldn't sleep, couldn't get no rest because so much stuff was on her mind. And with all that stuff right, she ended up with anxiety and started becoming depressed. And she didn't even know it until one day, she tried to kill herself. Now, the story behind that incident goes, she said she was in a hotel, right? In a hotel room one day and just all of a sudden decided that she didn't want to live anymore. She didn't want to live another minute. And that's when she went to the window 
and stuck her foot out the window, but in front of the window was a radiator that was covered by a long curtain. And when she tried to get her left foot out to the ledge, it ended up getting tangled in the fabric or whatever. And that's when the housekeeper opened the door just in time and saw her at the window and that just made her come back inside that's crazy and you know after that incident she went and got help for her anxiety and depression and started taking medications which did make her feel better but you know that medication she didn't want to take medication though for the rest of her life she knew it wasn't right just taking medication like that because it made her feel like a zombie and it made her feel spaced out she was hooked on that volume that's what the doctor prescribed to her, Valium. And that's when her sister decided to take her back to her roots, which was church. And she prayed. She prayed and prayed and it worked. She got off the medication and she became a born again Christian. Now feeling better, she released the album titled I Remember Yesterday, which she combined with that album. That was a combination of modern disco with musical styles of the past and that album ended up going certified platinum and the single called I Feel Love was another big hit that went certified gold and hit number six on the Hot 100 chart and number one in the UK and it gave her her first American Music Award nomination for favorite soul R&B female artist. Now that same year she released another album but this album was a double album titled Once Upon a Time. And that album ended up going certified gold too. Then she did a song called Down Deep Inside, which was the theme song for the movie called The Deep, starring Nick Nolte and Louis Gossip Jr. In 1978, she landed a role in the movie called Thank God It's Friday. And her song The Last Dance was a big hit. It hit number three on the Hot 100 and was certified gold. And it pushed the soundtrack to certify gold that song was a that song was a big hit y'all and it gave her her first ever grammy award for best female r&b vocal performance and the movie won an academy award and a, and a golden globe award for the best original song and to be truthful the movie yeah it, it it was a failure in the box office but but see the last dance the song made it popular in a cult classic. Donna said when she did the movie, she was hoping that it would set off her acting career because she really wanted to be an actress. You know, her background is in the plays and the musicals and stuff, but she realized people just was more into her music and they loved her for that. So she left the acting alone and just focused on her music career. Now, right after that, she went on American Bandstand and became the only person in history to host the show American Bandstand with Dick Clark. That's how popular she was at that time after doing that. She was the only person in history to host American Bandstand with Dick Clark. Now, that same year, she did a live album called Live and More, and she did a cover of the song Make Off the Park, which hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and made her the first female artist to have a number one single and a number one album on the billboard charts wow i mean donna was on fire her music was taken over in the disco clubs people would lose their minds when her songs came on plus look donna's success was opening the doors up for other disco artists at the time like sylvester he had some hits on the charts at that time the group uh, A Taste of Honey had that song, Boogie Oogie Oogie. The Tramps had the song Disco Inferno. And Sheik and Now Rogers them was coming up. Just disco, disco music period was tearing up the charts. It was taking over. And the club scene <laughs> out of control. It was out of control. Donna said, Donna said she used to party at the legendary New York club called Studio 54. I'm sure everybody heard about that club. And she said it used to be wild up in that joint to the point where you can get lost and you can't control yourself. That club, 
Y'all gotta check the documentary out. That club had animals in there. All types of celebrities would be in there. People was doing cocaine, popping quaaludes, sex orgies. It was wild. Look, Donna said in that club, lots of people got lost in there and they died from all the drugs and alcohol and sex and stuff in there too. Because she said people, people who partied up in there, they partied so hard Donna said people really thought <laughs> in the year 2000, when that year 2000 comes, they was all going to die anyway. That's why they party so hard. Wow. She said that's what they really thought back then. That's crazy. Now, also around that time, right, she was in a real bad, abusive relationship with her boyfriend. And it got, it got real bad, y'all. He almost killed her. But she ended up getting out of that and surviving that whole thing because he was a real he was real jealous of her. Now, after that, right, in 1979, she released the double album titled Bad Girls, which became the best selling album of her career and was considered one of the greatest disco albums of all time. The Bad Girls album, triple platinum straight to number one on the charts the singles hot stuff bad girls all hit number one on the charts she won a best female rock vocal performance grammy she won the best female rock vocal performance grammy for the song hot stuff which made her the first black artist to win a grammy in a rock category crazy man plus look Plus, she became the first female singer to have three number one hits in the same year, too. And she had her own special called the Donna Summer Special, which aired on ABC. Then, Casablanca Records, her label, right? They was working her, too, man. They was putting her to work. Then they released another double album called On The Radio, which was her greatest hits, volume one and volume two. And the single on that, on that album which was really for the soundtrack called Foxes, was a big hit, and that sold millions too. Plus, plus she had a duet with Barbara Streisand called No More Tears, Enough Is Enough, and that also hit number one on the charts. Wow. And you know what? That was her third double album she had released. That was her third double album she put out, and that made her the first artist in history to have three consecutive double albums albums go number one man that's the live and more album bad girls album and on the radio greatest hits volume one and two all hit number one on the billboard 200 now like i said they was working donna man casablanca records was working donna crazy and you know right after that album though <laughs> donna left Donna left Casablanca Records because she felt she didn't have any control over her life and career. She said she was physically and emotionally ill when she signed with the label. Plus, it was a conflict of interest, too, because she was being managed by Neil Bogart's wife. Plus, she wanted to do, you know, another reason she wanted to get off the label, she wanted to do different types of music. She was ready to experiment in some other genres. But they just wanted her to keep doing disco music. And with the contract she was in, she owed them one more album. She owed them one more album. But she did end up filing a $10 million lawsuit against them, though. And, you know, after that, she left them. She ended up signing with David Geffen's label called Geffen Records. And she was actually, she was actually the first artist ever the sign to his new label he had just started it and right after he signed donna david geffen he signed elton john and the late great former beatles john lennon and his wife yoko ono right after donna because look john lennon was a big fan of donna's music too but the crazy part is about the john lennon he was murdered two weeks two weeks later after signing with geffen records wow that's crazy but anyway now Donna right, she signed with Geffen Records. She started working on some new music and using different sounds for her production, like more, you know, pop, R&B, and some rock stuff because people was tired of disco. 
and they was trying to ban the whole genre during that time. A lot of people hated. They hated disco at that time, man. They couldn't. They couldn't stand it when Donna was on top, because radio stations was blasting songs. <laughs> the Village People, Gloria Gaynor, Sheik, Earth, Wind, and Fire. They weren't even disco artists, but they had hit songs in the disco clubs. They was dominating the radio at the time. Saturday Night Fever, uh, the soundtrack the Bee Gees had been named Album of the Year at the Grammys Award a couple years before. Uh, they had the movie out, Tony Monero, John Travolta. Uh, you know, it, it's crazy. You know what's crazy? A lot of people really just thought disco would just be a fad and just fade away but it didn't at the time it didn't go nowhere at the time i mean people hated disco music so bad well they say it was mainly a lot of angry white rock fans because a lot of the rock stars a lot of rock artists started doing disco music too rod stewart blondie started doing it rolling stones kiss but well, all that hate it really all started from this Chicago DJ named Steve Dahl because he got fired from his radio station. He worked at because the station decided to switch from rock to uh, disco. They wanted to play disco 24 hours. And, you know, he couldn't believe that people would dance to a 20 minute Donna Summer song in their car. He just couldn't believe that. That's why they did that whole disco demolition night at the Chicago White Sox Stadium thousands of people showed up to destroy over 10,000 disco records but not just disco records though R&B records too they destroying disco records and R&B records wow but you know the crazy part is all they did was change the name disco music to dance and club music <laughs> on the charts they just want to get rid of the disco name so they just changed the name to dance and club music on the charts and everybody was happy. But anyway, now signed to Geffen Records. On October 20th, 1980, she released the album titled The Wanderer, which went certified gold, but she really didn't have any big hits on the charts with that album because basically the album was kind of rushed due to the dispute she had with Casablanca Records. But that same year, she did end up marrying her future husband, Bruce Sedano, who was also a singer and songwriter. And they ended up having two daughters together, you know, Brooklyn and Amanda. After that album, she started working on another double album titled I'm a Rainbow. But David Geffen, he just wasn't feeling that album. When she was working on it, he wasn't feeling it. So he shelved the whole album. And told her that she needed to work with uh, legendary super producer Quincy Jones. He put Quincy Jones and Donna together to do another album because he wasn't feeling that album she was working on. And on July 19th, 1982, she released her self titled album produced by Quincy Jones. She had the songs on there like uh, Love Is In Control, Finger on the Trigger, State of Independence, and The Women in Me. But that album kind of it kind of fell when it came to the sales, even though she was nominated for a couple of Grammys. But, you know, and you, and you know, uh, that song State of Independence is the one that Quincy Jones claimed Michael Jackson stole from Donna Summers for his hit, Billie Jean. But Donna admitted in a book, in her book, Donna said it was Michael Jackson, James Ingram, Brenda Russell, and Kenny Loggins all were in the studio and helped create that album with Quincy. But overall, that album just wasn't successful like her others because she just wasn't feeling Quincy Jones' production. She wanted to work with her old producers who knew her voice and they knew her sound. And to make matters worse, that lawsuit she had against Casablanca Records was costing her millions in lawyer fees. They say over $80 million to be exact. So she ended up settling that whole thing. Now, the only way she can settle that lawsuit was just to do one album she owed him. Do that one album she owed him. But the good thing was she get to keep her publishing. And on June 13th, 1983, she released the album She Works Hard for the Money, which took 
the world by storm. The song she works hard for the money hit number one on the Billboard R&B singles chart. And the video became the first video by an African-American female artist to be placed in heavy rotation on MTV. Wow, that's crazy. Because you know Michael Jackson was the first black artist, period, to be in heavy rotation on MTV during that time. If y'all remember, Rick James used to argue about that. And I think David Bowie came to his rescue, but black artists had to fight to get on MTV at that time. Now, how she came up with that song, She Works Hard for the Money, Donna said she was at a Grammys party, right? And she had went to the restroom. And when she went in there, she saw this little old lady who was in the bathroom. She was the bathroom attendant. She was just asleep in the corner. And her first thought was, man, she works hard for the money, that lady. And that's when the song just came to her. And she just started writing the song down on a piece of toilet paper. Wow. Now, another song on that album called He's a Rebel won a Grammy Award for Best Inspirational Performance. And you know, her and David Geffen kind of had a falling out because she works hard for the money. That album sold millions. And she gave it to Casablanca Records because she owed them that last album to settle that lawsuit, right? Now, G David Geffen, he just thought she shouldn't have gave them that album with all those hits. He just wished that she would have just gave him that album, put that album on his label and gave him another album. But that's the thing with music, though. You just never know what's going to be a hit. Donna just gave him the album to settle the lawsuit. She didn't know the album was going to be a hit. But also around that same year, in 1983, Donna did return back to her high school back in Boston. And she finally received her high school diploma. I'm glad she did that. I'm proud of her for doing that. Like I said, you know, she left school when she was receiving all those threats from that testifying on that gang. So she went back and got a high school diploma. But, you know, after that, she kind of she kind of took a break from the music industry and just just raised the kids with her husband and spent a lot of time with her family and friends. And, you know, she had a house with a farm with all types of animals. She just chilled and just just chilled being a mother and a wife. That's all she did. In 1985, she performed at the inaugural celebration for President Ronald Reagan. Then around 1989, Donna and her husband Bruce, they was working on a, doing a reality type sitcom show. Some kind of TV show, right? It was about an Italian American, Afro American couple sharing their home with their kids, their Spanish maid, and two sets of in-laws. But that show never saw the light of day because according to Donna's husband, Bruce, he said they felt the network that was supposed to do the show started acting funny because they were an interracial couple and they didn't want them to be married anymore. Wow, that's crazy. So that show never worked out. But another thing Donna was very good at was painting. And she was so good at it that people would buy her paintings between the prices of $1,500 to $3,500. And she even sold one of her paintings for $39,000. Wow. Now, after that, she got back to her music and hit the studio again and started working on some new material. And on August 23rd, 1991, she released the album titled Mistaken Identity, but she was hit with some controversy that same year and she had to go do a press conference and address the rumor that she was anti-gay after a magazine did an article on her. They was trying to say that back in 1983, Donna allegedly made several derogatory remarks about the gay community and HIV AIDS at one of her shows during the time she had announced she was a born again Christian. Now, they claim she said to the crowd that God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And AIDS was God's way of punishing gay people. But Donna responded saying she never said that. And she never chose friends based on their sexual preference. 
and she always embraced her gay fan base. And she did not know where the alleged quotes came from. Because see, back then in 1983, them remarks really hurt her career too. And her relationship with Geffen Records too. But you know, she ended up filing a $30 million lawsuit against New York Magazine because the article also hurt her sales for her Mistaken Identity album too. You know, she was claiming that some of the DJs and clubs refused to play the record because they thought she made them statements. But that case was later settled out of court for an undisclosed sum of money. Now, in March 1992, Donna received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And they say over 600 of her fans were there, including Dick Clark and Steven Seagal. In 1994, she appeared on the sitcom Family Matters as Steve Urkel's Aunt Una for Maltuna. I remember that episode, too. Yeah, I remember that one. And she appeared on the show a few times after that, though. Now, that same year, she released a Christmas album, her first and only Christmas album titled Christmas Spirit. In 1996, she finally released the album I'm a Rainbow, which was that album she had recorded back in 1981 that David Geffen had showed because he didn't like the sound of it at the time and made her work with Quincy Jones. So they released that album. They re-released the album in 1996. In 1998, Donna received another Grammy, but it was actually her first Grammy Award in a dance category, though which was for Best Dance Recording. And it was remix, It was a remix version of a song called Carry On. Now, in 2003, that's when the book came out. She released her autobiography book titled Ordinary Girl, which was co-written by Mark Elliott. And, you know, she talked about a lot of deep stuff in this book. Y'all got to get this book. Her depression, drug addiction with them pills, and spiritual journey as a born-again Christian. Good book. In 2004, she appeared as a guest on the show American Idol, which was the same year singer Fantasia won. And Jennifer Hudson was also on that season as well. That same year, she became one of the first inductees into the Dance Music Hall of Fame in New York City as both an artist inductee and a record inductee for her 1977 hit song called I Feel Love. Her producers, Giorgio Morata and Pete Bellotti, were also inducted alongside the Bee Gees and Barry Gibb and Barry White. In 2008, she released her last and final album titled Crayons. And, you know, the single called Stamp Your Feet and I'm on Fire, they hit number one. Them songs hit number one on the U.S. Dance Club songs charts. Wow. She was still dropping number one's hits. That's crazy. Now, in December 2009, she appeared and performed at the Nobel Peace Prize concert for President Barack Obama, which was hosted by Will Smith. Barack Obama and Michelle, they was big fans of Donna Summers. But on May 17th, 2012, Donna Summer died at her home in Naples, Florida from lung cancer. Wow. And that shocked everybody. That was a shock to everybody because nobody knew. Nobody knew. And every time you seen her, when she was doing the interview, she looked, she looked good and healthy. A lot of people just didn't know she had cancer because, you know, Donna was a, she was a private person. She kept that from the public. You know, the crazy part is, Donna said she was a non-smoker. She was a non-smoker, but some say she used to smoke back in her younger days and used to be around a lot of secondhand smoke when she used to perform in clubs. Now, another theory on how she got the lung cancer is when the whole September 911 Ground Zero thing happened in New York. Now, she said she was in her New York apartment on September 11th 2001 when the attacks occurred and asbestos dust clouds was all throughout the city following the collapse of the twin towers in an interview donna said she had a premonition about the attacks 
a month beforehand. And after it happened, she said she suffered from severe depression and wouldn't even leave her house. But you know, I saw an episode on on the series Autopsy. I love that show. The show Autopsy, The Last Hours. One of my favorite shows out, right? And Dr. Michael Hunter said Donna almost certainly died from smoking and her family's genetic history. Now, Dr. Michael Hunter, he blames Donna smoking during her early career. And after she kicked the habit, she was in a lot of smoke-filled clubs. Plus, he claims it was hereditary because her mother and younger sister also died of lung cancer. Wow. Crazy, man. You know Donna's daughters, man. Brooklyn Sedano. Brooklyn Sedano, who y'all probably remember her from the television show My Wife and Kids, right? She also did the movies Taken and Cruel Summer. Now, she's working on a documentary about her mother, Donna. And this is supposed to be her first project as a filmmaker. So y'all show love and support to her. So look out for that. And I hope she do a movie too on her. Yeah, she need to do a movie on her mother Donna too. Now Donna's other daughter, Amanda, also sings. And she's part of a group called Johnny Swim. Now here's the sad part though, right? About this whole Donna Summer story. They might have went, they might have moved past it by now, but they say um when Donna died, her fortune was worth over 75 million dollars dollars wow and they say her oldest daughter mimi and second oldest daughter brooklyn were fighting over who should get the most money but you know they say donna left all the money to her husband bruce though so i'm pretty sure he's just gonna split it up so hopefully by now they probably got all that straight now in 2013 donna summer was finally inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame after being nominated four times previously and the library of congress added her song called i feel love to the national recording registry labeling it its position as a historically important work of art in 2018 they did a musical broadway play about donna's life called summer the donna summer musical which was successful but, you know, if y'all really want to find out more about Donna's life, she got that book out called Ordinary Girl. It's a very good book. Make sure y'all check that out. It's a lot of stuff in there about the things she went through. She been through some stuff. It was a wild ride to get to where she got to. You know, Donna, man, 63 years old, 63 grandkids and everything rest in peace the queen of disco donna summer 